everyone. Um, we are excited to have you here for the inaugural edition of our first Zoom cast. We hope to have these once a month uh, throughout the next year and beyond. And it seemed only fitting that our first guest and the entire time will be spent, generally speaking, with just one guest, and that's what we have today. Um, and it would be Margaret Novak, the founding board president of NASM. And so let me just tell you a little bit about Margaret, because not all of you know her as well as those of us who have been within NASM for uh, over a decade. So Margaret Novak is an entrepreneur, thought leader in aging, and pioneer in senior mood management. Margaret founded Moving Solutions in 1996, and for the next 25 years was an inspiring industry leader. She is the founding president of the National Association of Senior and Specialty Move Managers. She has chaired the NASA Ethics Commission for many years, and she developed industry training. In 2010, NASA recognized Margaret's commitment and service by creating the Margaret Novak Award for Excellence in Senior Move Management. In 2020, Margaret left the formal work world and began a new role as author, speaker, and champion of a revisioned picture of aging. Her new book, Squid, Re-Envisioning the Second Half of Life, consists of memorable stories that connect to larger themes, such as caregiving, forgiveness, family relationships, downsizing, and more. Squint demonstrates that with the right perspective and revisioning, the future is rich with possibility. Margaret grew up in Philadelphia and has graduate and undergraduate degrees from the University of Pennsylvania. She lives with her husband, Bill, and three dogs and divides her time between suburban Philadelphia and a home by the water in Maryland, where she often kayaks upwind. First, Margaret, huge congrats to you uh, for adding published author to your list of accomplishments. Thank you. Um, I just want to be very clear. I am a huge fan of Squint. I've read it twice now, and it's extraordinary. I think it's a, a really super book. And um, what I thought was kind of cool is you were just like you were a senior. You're an author like you are were a senior move manager, efficient and impactful. You don't clutter the page with a lot of extra verbiage, and you're uh, you're a great storyteller frankly. And, and that's uh, one of the key takeaways from this book is it's really a series of short stories, if you will. So um, we, just, we just are huge fans of it. And we encourage everyone to go to Amazon and get your copy uh, and get a copy for someone, uh, you know, that you care about. So first question, in the preface, you say that squinting has been a useful tool for you. Uh, you know, some edges blur and others come into focus. Since you gathered a handful of people in your home over the long weekend in 2002 to create NASM, what would you see if you were squinting back at that time? I think the concept of squinting as a, the concept of, of focusing on some things and letting other things blur allows you to look at the essence of something without being extracted, distracted by the extraneous. And if I were thinking about the initial meeting of people who were, who were often, uh, who were entrepreneurs in an industry that wasn't even recognized, there was such an excitement of, of meeting our tribe, of knowing that we were people that shared the same values and passions and that we had we were doing something important and impactful. And I think that continues to this day when you go to NASA meetings, there is still that sense of excitement of meeting with people with the same values, the same things you laugh over, the same frustrations, the same experiences of being entrepreneurs and having created something from nothing. And there is a lot of other things that go into running businesses, helping clients, but a lot of those details blur and what you're left with is the essence of people that share, that are truly your tribe. And that's what I remember from those times. And interestingly, I think it's still what NASA is about. For sure. Would you have expected it? Did you expect it 
to evolve as it has, to being certainly a leader in the aging services field, um, the professional home of over a thousand small businesses around the world at this point. Did you have That's any- That's easy, 100%. Did you? Okay. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. When you go, you go big, I guess. Um, as long as we've known you, you've been a huge advocate for storytelling, um, both in your personal life and certainly in your professional life. That's one of the things that, you know, differentiates the senior move manager from the mover is the soft skills of listening to the life histories and all of that of your clients as you help them downsize. So you've stitched together a series of stories and squint about your life. Can you share with us one of the most uh, impactful stories you've heard from a client over your 20 plus years as a move manager? Something that really resonates with you years later. I think one of the most impactful stories is actually in Squin, near the end when I talk about possibilities. I had moved a woman to a community um, and about six months later, we moved a single man. We, so she was a divorced woman, he was a widower and they found each other in the retirement community. And many of us have done that. We've moved clients that have subsequently found each other. So um, we then moved them together, they got married. And I went to talk with her afterwards. And they, she talked about how they met and fell in love and they marveled that in their ninth decade, they could have found their soulmates. And at the end, I asked her if she thought what best represented her finding love in her early eighties was hope. And she said, no, it's possibility. And what I loved about that was hope is very aspirational. Um, it, you could have hope, but you don't have to do anything about it. Um, you can wish something happens. Possibility may include elements of hope, but it also allows for individual responsibility. Something is possible but you may have to take action for it to happen. And it's a little bit like someone, there's an old joke, you know, God, how come I can't win the lottery? How come I can't win the lottery? And God says, you know, help me out here, buy a ticket. <laughs> and what I loved about that is there are a lot of things in life, especially now, I'm in my seventies and I look at, I hope I thrive as I get older. But I have accepted that that's not going to happen. I can't control that it will happen. But there are things that I have to take responsibility for to help that happen. And um, the physical fitness part is huge. I didn't realize it. Um, I guess in my 60s, as I was squatting down to help a client with her floor plan, and I wanted to be at eye level. So we were working on the coffee table and I would be squatting on the floor and then I had to get up from my squat and I realized this is getting harder. Um, in this decade, I realized that if I wanna feel well and not feel old, I have to take responsibility for, being at, for, for doing something about that. I can hope, but in general, and we have to take responsibility for good for some for creating possibility in our life. Um, yes, and that's not we something can't be sure that it happens, but but there are, but we can't just sit back and not take any responsibility for it either. And that's not something you know our culture is terribly good at. We have to kind of really uh, learn a lot of that because we're you know we're the first generation that really has longevity, you know, sort of built into our DNA a little bit just because of the technologies, you know, that have advanced medicine and everything. So we really, um, we've got our work cut out for us. Well, here, here's a story that made me realize my responsibility. 
um, I was have I joined a book group for the first time, and um, we had a meeting. There were three, four women there, and after we talked a little bit about the book, which included a character whose husband had been abusive, one of the women there talked about the fact that her father had been an alcoholic and had abused her mother before her mother left him. And I thought to myself, I've walked past this woman's home a hundred times with my dogs, and we've chatted about the weather or just miscellaneous things. She was an acquaintance. But until we were in a, a situation that created an opportunity to have more meaningful conversations, I didn't learn more about her. And I thought when I was young and raising kids, I made friends naturally with other parents of young children. When I worked in my work life, I had my work husbands and my work wives, and they were my friends that I'd made naturally. But now as a retired person, I'm going to, if I want to develop friends, and I know intellectually how important friendships are, read the articles that connection is so important and thriving. I have to, it's not just going to happen. I have to take some responsibility in creating sacred space or safe space or um, to let meaningful conversations occur. Uh, I have, so the idea of intentionality has been much more much more important to me and that sort of goes back to you can hope you have friends but you may have to do some things for it to happen exactly and let me ask you this do you believe that woman would have shared that information in her younger life maybe not right maybe not there are things that we wouldn't admit to ourselves or other people at different phases in our lives yeah, that's kind of a, the one of the fun parts about getting older is, you know, we do have with the clock sort of the sands of time, you know, slowly uh, pushing down, we we realize the imperative for, you know, companionship, friendship, genuine interaction, all of that in a way that I don't know that we feel at 40 or even 50. One thing that I found interesting is how long we hold on to hurt, hurts, slights, um, that we may not even, and other people may not even be aware. Um, I went to my 50th reunion and um, I was with another woman from my homeroom. And I said, we were just chatting, super, you know, superficial chit chat. And she said she rem she was writing a poetry and we talked about homeroom and she said, yes. And you read one of my poems and said it was trite. And I <laughs> thought 50 years ago, 52 years ago, we were in high school and she remembers and still is hurt by something that I don't even recall as having happened. Mm -hmm. And that's a kind of scary and I had an interesting thing happen in my elementary school, in my in fourth grade, I was very much picked on. I was bullied by the other girls uh, in my class. And maybe it was because I was very grown up and developed very early and very unhappy with myself. I mean, who knows what reasons someone becomes bullied. But there was one girl who was the ringleader and girls would say to me, I, I can't be friends with you if Susie White comes here. So, uh, and the next, and I would go home crying. My mother would meet with the principal. And the next year, none of the girls from my fifth grade were part of my, from my fourth grade were part of fifth grade. The school took that kind of care to give me a chance to start new. So fast forward 50 years, it's okay. I got over it. Uh, I get an email from this Susie White from Facebook saying, I've been following you on Facebook. Do you, I remember your mom was a brownie leader. I'd love to reach out and connect again. And I'm thinking, wow, for my narrative for 50 years, she was my nemesis. She doesn't even remember that. Yeah. Uh, and it made me think of the woman who was upset that I had said her poem was trite, that we 
how long people remember hurts and they may be hurts that other people aren't even aware of. By the way, I didn't reach out to her because um, I just didn't want to get into it. I thought I probably would have to get into it and didn't want to, but it was such an interesting learning for me that she probably has no recollection of something that was a big part in my life. And that's, that's part of getting older, kind of accepting that, I think. For sure. Um, along these same lines, you know, one of the reasons you outlined in the preface of the book, one of the reasons you give for writing the book was you wanted to um, change negative stereotypes about aging. And I think, you know, the book certainly does that. Um, what do you think we can do without writing a book, just in our normal lives? What can all of us do to squash those negative stereotypes? I think our homework probably starts at home. Uh, our recognizing in ourselves, we could have businesses working with older adults and feel we are so attuned to aging issues. Um, one of the stories I tell about, uh, there, but there were so many times that I recognized ageism within myself uh, and would be shocked by it because it seems so different from what I intellectually felt. But personally, it, it was it's Philadelphia, it had snowed, it was kind of a wintry mix. And I go, I'm going to put on boots. I don't want to fall. And then I said to myself, oh, don't you sound old? I don't want to fall. And then I said, why should that make me sound old? Shouldn't that make me sound smart? <laughs> um, and I thought, why does prudence and caution I'm equating that with being old instead of equating that with wisdom. There, and there were so many times I would catch myself having internalized ageism. And it's not an immediate change, even noting it within yourself. I think we have to be aware of it. Um, and each time we remind ourselves, maybe we'll make some progress in letting go of those feelings. And be aware of what we convey out loud. First, we have to admit it to ourselves and then watch what comes out of our mouth as well. Right. In 2002, when you and your colleagues started NASM, you know, social media didn't even exist. What do you, what role do you expect social media to play in the future regarding ageism and stereotypes of aging? You know, in my feeds on Instagram and Facebook, I see a lot of both, like the positive aging things, you know, little memes or TikToks or whatever about, but I see lots of negative ones too. Um, what role do you think social media is going to play in the future regarding the next generation's view of aging? I think unfortunately social media um, provides a lot of ex examples of ageism, a lot of jokes still about people being old, a lot of memes about people being old. And one of the issues for us is, will we call it out when we see it? There was something on, I think it was LinkedIn, Elon Musk made some ridiculous comment about people over 70. And there were a lot of negative comments about it. Um, but there are so, so many examples of it. So I, I think for all of us, will we be willing to call people out? Well, and, and the media calls out every other ism there is, except ageism. I, never I saw an article about um, a woman, a couple from Brooklyn that were on, I don't know the name of the airline, and they took a talus, a talit bag and made him put it on the floor and they wouldn't do it because they said it was a holy object and they ended up, the airline made them leave the airplane. But the art, the headline was, not the headline, but the first line was elderly couple and they go on to explain she's 72, he's 77 or something. <laughs> and they say they're from Brooklyn. But the question was, why was their age? I mean, they gave their age. Why did they also need the description of elderly? because their age is a fact, just like if they have blue hair or if they're tall or short, why did they have to, by giving the description elderly and associating it with 72 and 77, the media was implying that those, one, that those ages are elderly 
and that that was an important characteristic about what the story was about, and it wasn't. Um, so there's tons of examples of that. Yeah, and I, I, don't like, think, I don't think the choice of elderly is an accent. I think they feel, oh, it's going to get more attention if we use words like that. So but there's a lot making it likely that the media will continue to contribute to the problem. Well, and I think there must be a curriculum in every journalism school in the country that notes that 60 is the metric for stating someone's age for something that goes awry. Because you never see, oh, that 49-year-old woman, or even the 52. But I feel like once we get to 60, all bets are off, and then the age becomes part of the story. Do you notice that? That's right. That's right. Yeah, it's like 60 is the is the metric. So, okay, so um, this, this is one of the pieces of the book that I love the most. You delve kind of deeply into the lives of your, um, uh, your mother-in-law, Bubby, and your maternal grandmother, Anya. Is that, am I saying it correctly, Anya? Yes, you are. Okay, these two women were forces of nature in your life. And it sounds like in everyone's lives that they encountered. Very, very different ladies, right? Totally different. Um, and I loved all the stories around both of them. Do you use either of them or both of them in any way as you begin to shape Margaret Novak in later life? That's a really interesting question. Um, the stories about Anya, for anyone who hasn't read the book, she was a force to be reckoned with and could be very, very challenging, but also accomplished a great deal in her life. And um, I, it was hard for me to realize when I, because she was so negative toward me that I really also admired her. And um, my husband used to say, you're just like Anya. And he did not mean it as a compliment. Um, he, he said it to get my goat. <laughs> and it was only in recent years that I said, what's wrong with being a force to be reckoned with? I think every entrepreneur is a force to be reckoned with or we wouldn't be able to succeed. A lot of good things get done by strong people. Um, and when my grandchildren were born, I chose the name Anya as the name they would call me. So I came to peace with that and said, I'm okay with being, I've accepted that I am a strong person, sometimes too strong for better, or for worse, this is who I am. Um, so I've kind of accepted that about me and said, then let me see what I, let me take the good parts of that and see what I can do with them. My mother-in-law was, uh, Bubby was a font of wisdom and a great listener. I'm st I think I'm still aspirational here because I don't think I'm either. I don't know if I'm a font of wisdom and I know I'm not a great listener. So those are two things I will still be working on. But I know she did say that her final decade was one of the best times of her life. And I keep that in mind a lot to be able to look. And she was very dependent on other people and um, used a walker and was on oxygen. And to still be able to say that is pretty terrific. So I'm, I'm working on that. I'm, I'm still a work in process on that one. Well, and the way you describe her is it kind of goes along with what you said earlier about she seemed open to possibilities at every turn. Um, not initially. No. You know, she could also, she also fought some things right. and had reluctance. Um, but once, once she was exposed to things, could become very enthusiastic about them. Yeah. That, that was I think so we're great. all like that. When something is new, we could be, you know, we're reluctant. And then we say, this is great. Yeah, I, I think, was so, right. I'm sorry. So default, the default is to say no, right. Yeah. I also was aware, there were so many times I was aware that how lucky she was. I mean, she fell and broke her hip 
she could have also broken her wrist. And how much more complicated would recovery have been if she had, if she couldn't have used a walker because of a broken wrist? And that was just luck because a fall could break several things. I thought of how much more challenging it would be if someone had cognitive impairment and they broke a hip and couldn't follow the, the physical therapy regimen. Um, I thought when she got her hearing aids, which she objected to for a long time before she accepted them, that she could adjust the hearing aid based, there were three different um, adjustments on the back. But if she had had cognitive impairment and couldn't have understood how to make the adjustments, she probably wouldn't have been able to use hearing aids, which, have, which would have contributed to her feeling isolated all the more. So there, I thought how lucky she was that although she had a lot of issues, they happened without other issues that can snowball. And both with our clients and sometimes with our family members, we don't see that kind of luck. We see issues that happen at the same time and then recovery is more challenging. And often all it is, is luck. For sure. Your father died when you were seven. Your mother died when you were 26. In what ways did those profound early losses impact you for the rest of your life? It made you the person you are today. It wasn't until I had moving solutions for a number of years that it occurred to me that one of the things I got from being a, move, a senior move manager was I got to be, to feel like a daughter to my clients because I hadn't felt like a daughter. I hadn't been a daughter for so many decades. I didn't have parents to take care of since I was just in my twenties. And that was a real gift to me. Um, and I know that that's one of the things that made being a move manager so meaningful to me. It, it helped fill some holes for me. For sure. You also talk about your estrangement from your older brother for many years um, due to a conflict arising from the distribution of your mom's possessions, which is so strange coming, you know, from someone who basically invented senior move management or was one of, it's interesting that, you know, an item, a possession would bubble up to the point of a, a real estrangement from your brother. How do you reconcile that? Well, I think in the case of my brother and me, and I think in the case of clients that we interact with, it's never really about the thing that when family members argue over things, they are replaying relationships they probably already have, or dysfunctional relationships that probably already exist. Because we've all seen family members deal with dispersal of items without any kind of problem. But if they didn't get along to begin with, they will argue over things. My brother and I already had a bad relationship when my mom passed away. So it wasn't surprising to me. What was so interesting to me, and the book I talk about it about five years ago in my mid 60s, I decided overnight to, to end the estrangement, not to become best friends with him, but just to let it go. And what was interesting, I had no idea how common family estrangements are until I started reading some of the literature, they say eight to 10% of family members of siblings are estranged. And if you look at parents and children, it goes much higher, like up to 20%. But you don't hear about it because when families that get along really well talk about their family vacation, the rest of us that may have family members we don't talk to, talk to we just, we're quiet about that. Or we talk about the relationship we do have and don't mention the brother we haven't seen in 30 years. Um, and what they talked about was it's usually um, relationships that are 
estranged don't get resolved because no one's willing to go back and take responsibility for what happened. And I thought what was interesting is my brother and I didn't, we didn't rehash anything that happened. If we had, I think it would have been a wormhole that would have done no one any good. We just got together and moved on. Um, and I think, I, I would assume that there are people right here, there's I think 15 or 20 people on here. Some people here have family members with whom they don't talk. And if you do decide to reconnect, you don't have to become great friends. It's really about letting go of your own anger, but just move forward. Um, that was a really big learning for me, both how common it was and how easy it was to actually let go of. <laughs> yeah. Um, along these same lines, you talk about when you moved, we talked about in your introduction, you moved from your longtime home to independent living, a combination of independent living, and also at your shore house. But you talk in the book about how you brought too many things to the downsizing, you know, you sure. and um, you talk about a 30 cup coffee urn, you know, that people have for big parties and your mom's China, many place settings of China that you know in your heart you'll never use. Why did you have trouble letting it go, if you will, after all these years of helping others let it go? Um, some of the things were emotional, my mom's China. Some were rationalization. Some were uh, pragmatic. You know, we, there's all these different reasons. Um, so there was a lot I got rid of, but I was laughing at and looking back at the things that made the cut that shouldn't have, that wouldn't have if I had the perspective I had six months later. But it was what was a big learning for me is, you know, having been a move manager, first of all, I was like a downsizing queen. So how did my own downsizing go? I did a lot of the same things our clients do. The rationalization, I might need it. The, I can't let go of that. Um, and you don't think about all the things you successfully did let go of. You kind of get stuck about the things that are giving you a hard time. But what really hit me is you, it doesn't have to be perfect to say to our clients, it's a hard move. To say to them, it's okay. If, some, if you don't have time to finish, you'll finish once you get there. And maybe that's a good lesson for us as move managers, not to require perfection. Because they'll get to their new life. They'll begin enjoying life at their next, at their new home. And they will or will not deal with the extra things. But we sometimes might be too stuck on, has everything been downsized? And maybe that perfection is not important. Maybe we ought to be a little more empathetic or sympathetic to our clients and say, it'll be fine. Don't worry. We can come back in three months and go through that. So that was a learning for me. I might have been too demanding of clients to, to get it all done before they moved. Because mine other, was very imperfect and we did just fine. Any other insights as your own client? Other than that, um, I mean, that's a good one. Um, any other insights as your own client? Uh, yes. And uh, in the book, I've written how we decided to move after we got a, a shore home. We were moving under the best of circumstances, downsizing possessions to upsize our life so we could get to the shore home easily. And my husband had a really severe heart attack about eight weeks before our planned move date. And I didn't know if he was going to live. Um, I was having to decide, do I still move there if Bill dies? Um, fast forward, he's fine. He had surgery and had a remarkable recovery for someone who had so many comorbidity issues. But people wait until it's the perfect time. You know, they say, I'm not ready. And um, we were moving at the perfect time and then it was the worst time to move. And I think saying to our clients, don't wait until timing is perfect because it's never gonna be perfect. And I think that's a lesson to say to our clients because often they wanna wait until the timing is perfect, the, 
the stock market's perfect, the housing market is, is perfect, the downsizing is perfect. And um, I think they have to not, not demand that it be perfect. And we, maybe we need to encourage them saying, it's fine. And by telling a story like this, you know, people learn lessons from stories. And maybe that's one of the best ways for them to see that there is no perfect timing and that imperfection is, plan B is fine. For sure. Um, one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is if you could squint into the future, and I love that, I love the title squint because I do it a lot myself. I just did it the other day when we were putting up our Christmas tree and I squinted to see if I got the lights distributed evenly mm -hmm. on the tree. Uh, squinting is better than a level when you're hanging photo or pictures on your wall, right? You could, squinting is like a, a natural level, if you will. Um, but if you could squint into the future about senior move management, what would you see? I think that move management can and should be more wisely move, used. And we might need new ways to help people give themselves permission to use it. Um, I've illustrated this in some recent programs I did by actually talking about virtual training that I do. Um, when COVID started, I wanted to stay active. And I looked at a lot of YouTube videos that were geared to people my age and they had people smiling and I, none of them had traction with me. I didn't do any of them. And then a friend told me that she and three other people were part of a, a cohort that, got, that did virtual training with a personal trainer. So this was now gonna cost me money. So there's five of us on the screen at a time at maximum. We don't smile while we exercise. We grunt, we groan, we, we talk about things. Sometimes we laugh. But the difference is I do it. I do it about three, four days a week. It gives me accountability or I enjoy the, in it, the connection. So what I thought about is I could have had something for free and instead, but it didn't work for me. So instead I'm paying because this is what works. And I've used this as an example that someone could say, well, why can't I downsize on my own? I can get a book for free. I can watch a video about downsizing for free. Yes, you can. The same way you can watch a video about exercise. And for some people that works, but for a lot of people, it doesn't. And I don't feel bad that I'm paying for, for my personal training. I feel proud that I'm accomplishing my goals. And that people who use a move manager for downsizing or for packing, they shouldn't feel like they failed at something. They should feel like they're smart because they found a solution that enables them to accomplish their goals. And that's sort of the paradigm change that we might need to, to make to have people feeling that this is the smart way to be effective, not why can't I do this on my own? So I think we need to be smarter in how we describe it and make people feel proud of it, not sort of a little embarrassed or feeling that they should, they should do this themselves. For sure. Um, and then I have one last question for you. Do you fear getting older? Not so far. <laughs> good, good. Well, that ends my portion of the Q&A, but I know we probably have, uh, some of our attendees probably have some questions they'd like to ask you as well. Jennifer, do we have any questions at this point? Well, if you have a question, why don't you type your name in the chat and I will um, unmute you and put you on video. So if you've got a question for Margaret, you can type it in the chat right now. Um, and we'll, uh, we'll be able to let you um, ask your question. Not seeing anything right yet. 
One of the things, Margaret, that um, I also loved in your book that you talked about is the term becoming, that you want to use it in place of aging when you, you know, we talk about we're all aging and um, I love the positive, you know, I don't want to say spin because it sounds disingenuous, but I love the positive connotation of becoming. And one thing I learned in, you know, graduate school in gerontology was that never in our lives are we mostly unique, are we the most unique? We are, our entire lives, we are part of a cohort group. We're babies, we're toddlers, we're elementary school students, high school students, college students, parents, you know, empty nesters. And it's really only at the beginning of later life that we branch out from these cohort groups and become the most uniquely ourselves of our entire lifetime. Do you agree with that? I think for most of us, it is a freeing time. But I think it takes being older to get there. Mm -hmm. And looking yeah. back, I saw Barry asked a question about what would I do differently? And um, actually, I'm going to turn it around a little bit. One of the things that I am most surprised about in my life, but happily so, was that I had a major failure um, in, I guess, about 2004, 2006, that I had started a franchise and failed at it and lost hundreds of thousands of dollars. We didn't know if I'd have money to send my son to, to college. Um, I did it in front of my friends and my family and all of the NASA colleagues. And I, I could have withered out of embarrassment. And I somehow let it go um, and moved on. And I just am really grateful because I feel I could have so easily just slid into let me withdraw from this, from humiliation or from anger at myself because my husband trusted me. So many people had done, had put their trust in me and I failed them. And I forgave my, I, whether I forgave it or moved on, but I consider it one of the biggest miracles of my life. And for anyone who is dealing with something, whether we failed, we feel we failed a kid or we failed our colleagues or we failed our business or whatever, to be able to move on and say it's it's done is it's a wonderful blessing. If anyone ever wants to talk about that, feel free to call me. What did you what do you attribute that to? Because I remember that period of time. That was sort of around when we were becoming involved in NASA. Yes. And yes. um I, you know, you actually it in some ways it gave you um you know, a second life after it. Once you were put it behind you, you began the, writing the training program and all kinds of other things. Um, what well, do the ironic part was, as a franchisor, my responsibility was to create opportunities for franchisees. And my big learning was, I wanted to create opportunities for the industry, not just for the franchisees. I really didn't have my heart in it either right. because the things that excited me, I, I was more committed to the industry than I was to the franchise. Um, That's always been true. That's always been true. I think Jennifer and I are here to say that you always had the big picture in mind. Sure, you wanted Moving Solutions to be successful, and it ended up being one of the, you know, largest organizations in NASM. Um, but you always had your eye on the industry and what it, you enjoyed your personal success when there was expansive success across all the companies, I think more um, than I did a, a lot. lot would have. I did a lot. Yeah. And when I would be at NASA meetings, my most fun was not being around what I would call 
the old guard. It would be around people who were new because they would recharge me. The new members were the ones that I would talk with them and I would just feel excited. I remember you telling us that even after you had been doing it 15, 18 years or whatever, that you always learned something new from someone who had been doing it 18 months, that they had you fresh do. eyes on an old problem. And um, I think that goes along with what you were saying earlier about, you know, uh, making new friends later. Um, I think, you know, that's one of the things people within NASM love about you is that you don't come to conference thinking you know it all. You're still there to learn. And um, uh, that's just a, a great personal um, attribute. And it comes through in the book that you are always becoming and you're always learning and you encourage us to do the same. So if, any if other you questions? wanted to know what I, what I miss the most in being retired, I miss not having a team. I miss not being part of a group of people who, whether we're excited about something or frustrated by something, I miss not problem solving with people. Um, that's what I miss the most, not having a team, not being part of a team. For sure, for sure. Jennifer? Oh, absolutely, the book is, is available. Yeah, it's available as an ebook. Just go to Amazon. Yeah, uh, go to Amazon ebook and also in print. I was really on my Kindle. Some communities have purchased large quantities of the book and given it as a gift to prospects, and that's that's a real sweet spot for me. Uh, that was really exciting. One of the things I really loved about the book, though, was I really felt like um, it was so seamless. You know, some books you read and you feel like you're walking around in combat boots, kind of. It's heavy. It's drudgery to get from, you know, chapter to chapter. It's, but you're, you know, bound and determined to do it. This felt lyrical. It felt like a ballet in comparison. I wanted to turn the page all the time. I wanted to get, I wanted to savor what I was currently reading and I couldn't wait for the next chapter. It's, it's really well done, Margaret. Very well Thank done. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we do not have any more uh, questions. Gosh, I guess you oh. just told your, oh, well, here well, we go. There is, wait, wait, wait. There is one question from Nicole Raymer. Margaret, thank you for always sharing your time and wisdom. You are such an inspiration. What are your thoughts about move management companies like mine that have added moving services, bought a truck, hired experienced and professional movers, and created a one-stop shop? I think the one-stop shops are a great idea. Um, I, I don't underestimate the, the challenge of adding a moving company on. Um, I find it more challenging because of all the regulation and all the, um, the, the different groups that you have to manage. But it seems like such a no-brainer in terms of one service selling the other and being able to really design the right move plan. I mean, we all know it's about the move plan. And moving and move management are so interrelated. I think the way to provide the best service to the client is being able to really talk about the move plan and being able to provide both is, is the perfect way to do that. Okay, a, a couple more questions um, from Sarah Gom. Um, I haven't read the book yet. Would this be a book for an 80 plus year old client? Oh, yes. They'll absolutely enjoy it. So will their daughter. <laughs> and here's a comment from Cindy Hopin. Hi, Margaret. So great to see you. Just finished your book and it was so familiar and really inspirational. I plan to give copies to my staff as a Christmas gift. Wish you were on my team. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on this, especially your first hello program. It was wonderful seeing you all again. I'm here if you... Um, need anything or just want to lay up for chat? Well, we appreciate you so. sharing your time and talents with us as always. Mary Kay, thank you for facilitating such an engaging conversation. Um, and uh, we will watch for our next uh, hello coming in January. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Margaret. Thank you. Bye.